The hit PvP game, Identity 5, is loved by fans not just for the innovative 4v1 gameplay, but also for its hallmark cast of characters with peculiar abilities and dark, tragic backstories. As new content is released, we're slowly getting to know these characters, and bit by bit we're piecing together the mysterious circumstances that brought them all to the manor. But, did you know there is backstory to the backstory? Using clues available in-game and on Identity 5's official website, we'll begin searching for the lives and times of the real historical figures and fictional works these cute, creepy characters were inspired by. So dust off your magnifying glasses, detectives, from Lovecraftian horrors of the abyss and Victorian serial killers to circus performers and decorated war heroes, we'll be pursuing the real identities of Identity 5. For today's investigation, we'll be looking at the ridiculously regenerative Dr. Emily Dyer. How many times are you going to try that? I need practice. I don't want to hurt anyone. Congratulations, Dr. Jones. This clinic is losing money. Negligent. the address he said this was taken. Our prime suspect is Amelia Dyer. Now, with the exception of Jack the Ripper, who is just too obvious to even count, Amelia was my first suspect, and sometime after I had begun research on her, I returned to the Identity 5 wiki site, and at the bottom of the page, I found that there had been an addition. They had found her too, based on Amelia Dyer, an English serial killer who was infamous for murdering... <laughs> Several infants in her care? Oh, my dear detectives, do we need to talk. So we have to head to England. In 1837, Amelia Elizabeth Hobley was born the youngest of five children to shoemaker Samuel Hobley and his wife Sarah in a village called Pyle Marsh that was then just outside of Bristol. 
Now, just a few years prior to this, there was this thing passed called the Poor Laws Amendment Act, and this stipulated that the courts would no longer be pursuing the fathers of children born out of wedlock for financial support. And that was just one component of these changes to the poor laws in that year. The general aim of the Poor Laws Amendment Act was moralistic. They wanted people to stop using these welfare services because they thought that it was making people indolent and just dependent upon it and that they weren't working as hard as they could or weren't being chased to not have children out of wedlock and that by making these services fewer and harder to come by, that this would motivate people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak. Suffice to say, it didn't work. And what this really actually did then was set the stage for the overcrowding and the abject poverty and the crime that the Victorian era has come to be known for. Now, I tell you all of this background information because it will actually come into play in the trajectory of Amelia Dyer's life and our narrative in general for today. So here I would like to give you your official content warning. Viewer discretion is advised. But onward. In 1841, when Amelia was about five years old, her sister, who was just a year older than her, Sarah Ann, dies. Somehow. Then, in 1845, when Amelia was about nine, her infant sister also died. Now, this is tragic, but do keep in mind that at the time, the infant mortality rate was hanging around 15 to 18 percent, and notable for our story later on, if the woman was unwed, that rate doubles. Then, just a few years later in 1848, when Amelia is around 12, her mother contracts typhus. And now typhus is an infectious illness that is borne by fleas. And among other wretched symptoms, it is known for spiking high fevers and often making the sufferers delirious or hallucinate. Amelia's mother during the course of her illness, descended into madness. It is said that she became violent, that before she expired, she beat the children, and Amelia likely would have been her caretaker, and at least was witness to this. So in 1848, after her mother's death, Amelia moves in with an aunt in Bristol, and she takes up an apprenticeship with a corset maker. The next we see is that in 1859, Amelia's father dies when she's probably about 23, and her older brother James takes up the family business. Now, the, for reasons unknown, her and James seem to have had a falling out. So she permanently moves out of the family home and into her own private lodgings in Bristol. Then, presumably sometime in about the next year, when Amelia is around 24, she marries a 59-year-old widower, but it's possible they may have fudged their ages on the marriage papers a little bit to make that age gap seem a little smaller. They subsequently have a daughter, Ellen Thomas. He helps her start down a new path and join a nursing school, and she begins studying as a midwife under a woman named Ellen Dane, who, it turns out, ends up having to leave the country and flee to the US to evade authorities, and that's because of what she was doing that Amelia learned from her. So Amelia begins offering lodgings for pregnant women, who presumably would have been pregnant without being married, and this would have offered them a place to stay out their pregnancy, keep it hidden or secret or at least away from prying eyes until they gave birth, and then she would offer to take on the infants and care for them for a weekly payment. And this is a practice known as baby farming. Thank you so much for watching, let me know what you think in the comments, and we will pick up next time with the next installment of Amelia Dyer.